we have been talking about collecting first party data for you know preparing for the future and i actually still keep hearing that you know brands need to prepare for for the future when it comes to their first party data collection but actually the future that we keep referring to is is now Hello and welcome back to Identity Architects, the InfoSum podcast that spotlights the pioneers in the media industry who are changing the way that data is used to power better customer experiences. I'm your host, Ben Chiketti, and for this episode, our enterprise sales director, Moda, had the opportunity to speak with Anita Klinkosh, audience architect at Havas Media Group. Together, Moda and Anita discuss the importance of first-party data, consumer privacy, data hygiene, and much, much more. Before we jump into that conversation, just a reminder to hit that subscribe button so you know when the latest episodes of Identity Architects land. But without any further delay, here's Moda and Anita. Good morning, everyone. Um, Super excited today. I have got uh, a very good friend of ours from Havas Media Group, Anita, who is the audience architects uh, specialist working across a number of their brands and, and, uh, and clients. Anita, welcome. Hi, Moda. Great to be here. Um, super excited. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, most welcome. Obviously, I know you and we are engaging on a regular basis on the number of projects that we have ongoing. It would be great if we could just um, have a brief intro on Anita, what you do, um, and just a little bit about Havas, your time at Havas Media Group. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Anita Klinkosh and I'm an audience architect at Havas Media Group. Um, so in my role, I'm supporting our clients with their first party data strategies uh, with a particular focus on uh, audience activation, um, as, you, as my title sort of uh, describes. Um, yeah. And that is sort of uh, all to ensure, you know, data driven targeting and measurement. Amazing. And it is a super exciting role, uh, especially with the number of conversations we're having with your clients and partners. Um, it's, a, it's a role that role that's evolving across the wider industry so it's fascinating absolutely i'm so um i'm super excited that that have us sort of um decided to to create a role that is specifically focused on uh on audiences obviously you know we we talk about audiences uh across many uh departments uh within our industry but i'm I'm super excited that we have a role that sort of focuses specifically on you know um what audiences we, we um, how we sort of um, look at audiences, how do we create audiences from uh, our clients' first party data, how we segment them, how we drive insights and how we then activate um, activate that. So um, I think that the, the, the really important part of my role is to sort of use a first party data in defining um, in defining audiences, which is uh, obviously in a, in a you know, current state of, of, yeah. of our yeah. industry, super exciting. Uh, absolutely, and I can't wait to get onto the the the, the more nitty gritty of your day to day life and and you know how you're working with Havas. But before we get there, let's get to know you more, Anita. So, um, a quick easy one: What was your earliest memory of advertising? Oh, um, do you know what? I think that one of those earliest memories um, is probably linked to, to Christmas. Um, I really remember that uh, Coca-Cola at Christmas album oh, yeah, yeah. around 1995. So not necessarily because I really liked drinking Coke when I was a kid, uh, but I think it was one of those first Christmas ads that would air uh, in that sort of run up to Christmas. So as a kid, it would really put you in that sort of cozy Christmassy mood, you know, snow, um, Christmas lights, um, you know, thinking about all those uh, Christmas gifts that, that I was going to get. So that definitely sort of um, stuck in, in, in my uh, memory. And it's definitely one of those ads that isn't necessarily linked to, to an immediate purchase and definitely not from, you know, directly from a five-year-old, but 100% um, impacting the way you feel. Completely agreed. And that's a really lovely memory of, of um, it just brings many things to life, to your point, like, you know, not just purchasing, but um, Christmas, a season, you know, a season of giving, being around family and friends and just winding down the year. Um, absolutely. And I think 
scary enough we're kind of start seeing those adverts appear on our tellies yes. um, across the wider mediums very shortly um so yeah super looking forward to that nice nicely goes into what was your first ever job in advertising or marketing um yeah so so i actually came into marketing and advertising as a project manager uh, for what was back then one of the sort of largest independent digital marketing agencies and they called search laboratory who are actually now uh, part of Havas media group um so in in that role i was uh, responsible for delivering sort of digital campaigns at that global scale um so i do have a background in in, in languages um so it was super exciting to be able to you know to, to run those global uh, global campaigns um and back then i was actually very much at that delivery side of marketing slowly finding my way to more of a sort of strategic and data focused roles that that um i'm you know lucky enough to be in now and amazingly you've carried on and you know landed yourself in a in a in a role where you've continued to you're you're on your passion points staying in the realms of data um working across many different brands and and clients um within the Havas group um and then you know you, you've had a very impressive journey to your to your career now what would you say you love doing right now and that's made you stayed in, in and kept you interested in the in in this overall industry um do you know what I, i've been a part of so many great projects over the years but um i think something that really really you know excites me about my current role and the industry uh you know as we see it today is that ability to innovate especially now with uh, automation machine learning there is so much to explore and and really undertake things that have not been done in the past and you know I, I feel it's it's really hard to be bored in our industry and for someone like me who really loves to have their fingers in 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 many pies um, it's super exciting I love learning new things and this is definitely a huge part of, of what I enjoy about what I do right now um, here at Havas. No, completely. Um, you, you're spot on about every day is a new day in our world right now. Absolutely. Um, and I love it. I think, you know, we've come a long way in the industry. Um, there's, there's, We're definitely going through transformation and all for the positive reasons. And I think that's the part that's keeping us all excited. Um, you know, it's just the, di- the, the different journeys every partner is on. And it's nice that we can contribute to that. So on that... Um, Knowing everything you know now, um, from the very first days of your career in this, in, from you know your role in this industry, to where you are now, um, what would you say to yourself when you first started your career? Do you know what I? probably would start with telling myself that it's absolutely impossible to know everything in such a fast-paced constantly evolving uh, evolving industry so uh, you know keep asking questions don't settle for the status quo and really get out of your comfort comfort zone because this is really where innovation and and growth comes from uh you know that's probably something that you really need to remind yourself of you know regardless of how long you've been in the industry um maybe even more so now we see so many changes happening so far so so far so uh, definitely don't settle for the status quo and do new things get out of your get out of your comfort comfort zone I love that. And I think when, when I was sitting with your counterparts on the uh, returning the, you know, the Havas webinar, um, that was a common theme of just challenging the clients, challenging the industry, challenging the status quo. Um, I think, you know, that's a mantra info some every day, like just challenge it. And it, it's exciting because you start to understand the journey. You get to understand the why is what we're trying to achieve here together. No, I love it. You know, within the advertising industry, uh, you know, we're, we're now at this journey of first party data, um, ident- the concept of identities, um, the ability to go and identify individuals across many different platforms, devices, mediums. We get it. We're in it day to day. Our peers get it. Our industry friends get it. Our clients get it. Right. We're, we're all on this journey together. 
but if we had to go and present this at a at a local school just to get you know the the younger generation into what we're doing how would you explain this to a 10 year old Oh, that's that's a that's a good one. Uh, by the way, I I absolutely love the approach of talking, you know, relatively complex concepts as if you were trying to explain it to to a child. Because at the end of the day, if if you if you can't, then you don't really understand it, do you? Yeah. Um. So so what what is identity a version for for a for a ten year old? Um. I guess a thing that you've just been to um, football training with some of your teammates, you know, you were wearing football boots, running around, trying to score a goal, learning new tricks, etc. Um, and then the next day you went to a, a drama or theatre class, wearing different clothes, engaging in completely different activities. And then finally, you spend a weekend with grandma and granddad playing chess or, or doing jigsaw. So... Uh, there's so many different situations and activities, but in all of them, you are still the same person. So all of those constant factors really make up your identity and make you who you are outside of everything that, you know, may be changing around you. So if we translate that into an advertising world, you wouldn't be really wearing your football boots to a drama class and you wouldn't be playing chess at a football training. So although it's always the same person in those multiple situations, the context in which you see a specific ad really matters and it really needs to be tailored to your current uh, situation if you want to create the right response. Um, so that's 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 my version for a ten year old, but I'm I'm really glad I didn't pursue a, a career in, in teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm I'm gonna actually use some of those analogies because that's a that's a nice simplified way of explaining it. Um because you know, we're in this I mean, we we have many joint sessions together, um, and it can become complex very quickly and it can become overwhelming. And I think to your point sometimes we just need to simplify it and just give it a very simple explanation of of what are we doing here and what 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 is identity how is it associated to us as humans right and, to, and i and you're in this day today our jobs can become intense at times but what keeps you awake at night oh, um hopefully nothing because i really value my eight hours of sleep uh but if there is anything that ever does keep me awake, it's probably constantly thinking about what's the next exciting thing that I can get involved in, both um, at work or outside of uh, work. So I absolutely love when things are busy and I really try to make sure that there's never, you know, two days that look the same. Um, and uh, as you as you sort of referred to earlier, I definitely think I ended up in the right industry, given how dynamic marketing and advertising is. Amazing. And then that nicely goes on to you love the industry. You're very passionate. What inspires you? Do you know what? It, it, it definitely is people who keep working on their goals despite any barriers that for some may be, may be impossible to, to overcome. So that could be anything from, you know, crossing a finish line of a race, getting a place at their dream university, landing their dream job, learning new skill. I'm absolutely inspired by people who never give up, give up to make their dreams come true. Amazing. Right, we're going to end it with, um, and then we can close the red book of Anita and then go into the professional chapter. Um <laughs> My favorite question, by the way, this is even my most favorite question over the professional ones, um, because it tells a lot about a human. If there was a song or a soundtrack to your life, um, what would it be? Uh, do you know what? I. It doesn't have to be one, by the way. I, I think there is a very, you know, uh, uh, there's two runner-ups. Um, however, and I, I, I promised myself I would try to um, refer from talking about triathlon because uh, that's something that I absolutely love. However, as someone who absolutely loves triathlon, it has to be um, thunderstruck by ACDC. So they actually played a song at the beginning of um, Ironman races when, you know, you 
are overwhelmed by all the emotions and, and you question yourself, you know, have I done enough training? Am I ready for it? And then you hear thunderstruck and you just go for it and you give it your best, just like you should in every aspect of, of, of your life. Amazing, amazing song. Um, and I can feel that the, the, the pump and the fire. Absolutely. Coming, you know? I'm assuming when you're sat around the, the Habas office, um, and your headphones are on, that is the soundtrack playing. In the oh, background. yeah. I wish they could just play yeah. it through the loudspeakers. Go for it, Anita. Like, <laughs> come on, everyone needs to hear it. Maybe that, yeah, maybe that's my next suggestion. <laughs> Amazing. Right. Let's get into the, the nitty gritty of um, our industry and, you know, the more about what you're achieving, how you see this industry shape up. Um, and going back to the topic we both love and, we, you know, the, the, and our day to day lives as well is first party data. And, you know, of with every organization we're speaking to, um, even just us, you know, in for some and have us. Um, but it's not just specifically related to this, but in, a, in our overall industry, um, it's a part of it's an integral part of everyone's marketing strategies today, tomorrow. Um, everyone's on this journey. We know it. Everyone's at different stages of this journey. But I guess, you know, from your perspective, because you've been across it all um, with clients, um, you know, when they were using third party cookies, when they were deploying data strategies in general, what makes first party data so successful in your eyes compared to all the other data strategies that have been deployed? Yeah, you know, first party data is is the most accurate and relevant data that you have access to as a business uh, because it comes directly from you know consumers or, or your customers who have willingly willingly shared that with you in most cases uh, you know in an act of some meaningful exchange it's yeah. owned by you and it's unique to your business and that also means that you know you're not getting it from exactly the same inventory as thousands of other brands including your competitors so um it offers insights to your customers specifically if you are gaining audience insights through third party sources only, you are very likely building similar audience profiles to everyone else in your industry using exactly the same, um, you know, data sources. So with first party data, you're gaining insights to, to your customers, people who buy um, from you, people who have, you know, got into that meaningful exchange with your brand. And when used correctly, first party data is absolutely a, a goldmine for for your brand plus uh you you know you obviously have full control on or over how this data is collected how it's stored and who you share this data with um which then further enhances that that meaningful exchange or, or relationship with with uh, with your uh, customers or, or wider consumer groups um and that in turn builds trust so if you want to elevate, um, elevate, you know, user experience and drive loyal customers, building trust is absolutely an essential first step. I agree with everything there. And I think it's becoming more and more important. I mean, you touched on this in the earlier part of our discussion, which was, and I'm going to go back to the analogy that you gave for a 10 year old, you know, as humans, there are so many, there are multiple touch points or I'd say attributes against us. And it changes, it's dynamic. And understanding that is so important today in this day and age, because it goes back to your point of building trust, a relationship, a one-to-one -one connection with a consumer, right? And if you've got that, it helps with loyalty, retention, it helps with upselling, it, it, there's, a, there's a deeper value exchange. Absolutely. And, you know, with, with the process of collecting that first party data, you can build a an ever changing view of who your customers are rather than relying on who they were yesterday. Absolutely. Perfect for the next question, because it goes for, in terms of recommendations, right, for our brands and advertisers or not even just brand I mean, businesses in general, media owners. What are the um, recommendations for them during this collection process? Because I remember, you know, this could go back 10 years. It was a difficult task to collect data in general and especially to collect, you know, identity level data, like to, to have that one to one connection. So I think um, we have been talking about, you know, collecting um 
first party data for you know preparing for the future and I actually still keep hearing that you know brands need to prepare for for the future when it comes to their first party data collection but actually the future that we keep referring to is um is now so you know deprecation of cookies automation yeah. predictive modeling etc yeah. these are you know these are not things of the future but very much you know we are surrounded by by those concepts uh, today so i think that brands are aware of that and a lot of you know things that i'm pr probably going to 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 say these are my recommendations have already been done uh but um i, I think that the 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 main thing that I would say is in my recommendations come to you know uh that that the data collection etc is invest in actually in a coherent data strategy so it's not just about collecting as much data as possible but really understanding and mapping what data you're currently co collecting and thinking about how it can be activated to help you drive uh, business outcomes um, and you really need to make sure that your your data is clean it's organized and it's actionable so these are the three key factors um, you know that underpin your your wider data strategy uh, I think that one thing that can help with all those three aspects uh, is investing in a CDP so customer data platforms are becoming increasingly important in the overall data strategy because they provide you know that 360 degree view of your customer and they can really act as an engine for a unification segmentation and meaningful activation of your data and uh, you know um it, this is all great however it, it's it's critical to, to to remember that you know getting the most out of your data or out of your sort of cdp or whatever technology uh, or solution you're using it all depends on data hygiene so maintaining that data quality is key because at the end of the day however you activate the data uh, you know any algorithms or models uh, are only as good as as you know the data that you feed it absolutely um and you're right like we're seeing it more and more we're seeing brands even carving out teams now you know um Havas, you're a prime example. Um, your team, it exists because these clients need that expertise. They need advice. They need recommendations. Um, and we're seeing this across the ecosystem. So you're right. The future is now. Uh, as much as we call it the future, it's happening. And everyone needs to almost be at some point in that journey. And it's exciting because we're seeing um, various different strategies and tactics being deployed but the end goal is still the same. I guess we can all agree, um, especially me and you, because we can agree on this pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that you know there is a way we used to go about data-driven advertising. Um, and there are some, there's been flaws in the overall strategy. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but it'd be great to just hear, kind of have your opinion on, you know, who's responsible for kind of rebuilding the foundations of of our industry or the digital advertising industry um to make it better to make it more um, promising to to ensure um you know the the changes that we do deploy are positive yeah i think it's 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 a really good question and and we should really be asking each other um those questions but I don't think I'm going to say anything original here by stating that, you know, we operate in an industry of, of complementary responsibilities when it comes to building that, you know, uh, sort of more sustainable digital advertising where everyone should essentially fill in to 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 build, you know, to, to make it happen, to build, to rebuild the foundation of, of, of digital advertising. You know, outside of, you know, being brands, advertisers, agencies, publishers, data companies, you name it, we are all consumers. So, you know, honoring that consumer expectations about their data, um, about their privacy, really means building a better ecosystem for ourselves too. So, you know, an ecosystem where we can focus on that transparency and value exchange, something that we refer to um you know previously but it really requires a you know a collaborative effort from absolutely everyone involved and working together um to really find those solutions that 
work for both sides of the advertising world because yep. those yep. who can have an impact and those who can rebuild those foundation of advert uh, of you know of advertising do actually exist in both of those worlds. So we all need to agree on how we collect consumer data and um, what do we give in return of that data, how that data is being handled and how it's activated. You know, like consumer behavior has evolved massively since, you know, we first started using internet connected devices and, and we really need to rethink what the advertising world should, should look like. You know, a world that connects brands with consumers to drive a meaningful, uh, you know, exchange meaningful meaningful results uh, without infringing on, on, on privacy. And I think that the change is actually happening. You know, privacy and compliance are huge parts of our everyday conversations with our clients. Um, they are a huge part of how we approach building uh, strategies and how we service our clients as an agency. And I really see this collaborative effort every day um, where basically everyone fills in and holds the other party accountable. Absolutely. And it's to your point. Um, I, and I loved you know, one thing I loved, which you made a point on, which was thinking of it as us, we're con we are consumers of many different brands across the ecosystem. And it's almost like asking yourself the why and the what would you like to change because that could help give the wider industry the the, the support, right? Because um, you almost sometimes forget on our day-to-days of we are an employee of X company and we should be thinking in that mindset. But actually going back to your point, you know, which is, no, we're consumers. And what do I want to see as a change? And um, do you foresee any challenges with all these changes taking place and all these companies coming together and the, and the industry wanting to come together? Um, yeah, any challenges that you foresee? Yeah, I, I think that the, the main challenge really comes from our tendency to look at changes as a problem rather than as an opportunity to revisit that status quo uh, and find better solutions, uh, solutions that, that are more suitable to the world that we live uh, we live in now. It, of course, we need to acknowledge that, you know, the, the challenges with measurement and accuracy, uh, yeah. obviously, you know, they, they do exist, but these are only challenges if if we actually look at them from, let's call it an old world perspective and perhaps um, for what we would call performance marketing. But those old measurement solutions have been flawed from you know the moment we stopped using a single device to engage with brands uh, and getting uh, ad exposure. So, you know, um, we need to embrace uh, that that change and we need to find more suitable solutions like you know data modeling uh, first party data solutions for that improved measurement and really filling in the gaps that have been created by for example deprecation of common um, identifiers such as third party cookies some regulatory uh, regular regulatory changes um, yeah. and in general how consumers give their consent or engage with, with brands and there's no and this is the thing, there's no right or wrong answers here, there isn't it? Um, you know, I naturally advise everyone is we should just be testing. We just don't know what we're going to learn, especially in this new era of, you know, identity level data. Um, because there's so many variables like volumes, the type of data we have, is it organized in the right way? There's a lot that we need to kind of get right before we can actually say, right, this is the this is the blueprints of how we should operate. Um, and on that, you know, are there brands are on this day to day and you experience that with the with your partners? Are there any, you know, those who are kind of at the beginning of this journey, any best practice advice you, you know, you feel be suitable? Uh, yeah, do you know what? I think that what holds most br uh, brands back from using the first party data effectively is the lack of sort of coordinated plan or a strategy on data hygiene, how that data should be organized and segmented um, in a meaningful way, and how it can be activated. You know, there's not much point collecting data if it's not used for insights and activation. So a, a, a couple of, um, you know, best practices of, of things to, to always uh, bear in mind is, um, you know, your data strategy and the outcomes that you can expect from it are all underpinned by that 
data hygiene or data cleanliness. So when I say cleanliness, I don't only mean, you know, typos, formatting, uh, disposable email addresses, um, etc, etc. So some of those things, although, you know, not entirely un uh, um, unavoidable, they can definitely be improved uh, by a bit of a, you know, front end effort. Uh, but another important aspect of your data hygiene is, is consent, something that, again, we touched on um, already. Um, so make sure that you review your content policy and how your uh, customer's personal information is stored and how it's being uh, used to, you know, to, to help you reduce privacy risks and improve that overall uh, customer experience. Some of the biggest changes that we've seen recently in our industry are being driven by consumers and their expectations about their data. So any brand that wants to build a meaningful re relationship with their customers really need to establish a logical framework around their first party data. And that goes uh, you know, beyond simply com complying to, to those regulations. And then another element is, is segmentation. So this is all about gain gaining a, a deeper understanding of, of your customers or, or, or group of, of customers. Uh, it can help you become more customer driven. And when it's when it's done right, it can have a huge impact on on um, on your business. But however you're slicing your data, you always need to ask yourself, so what? If there is no clear outcome that comes from the segmentation, it will have a really, really small value to your business uh, because you won't be able to activate that data to drive those, um, those outcomes. And when it comes to activation, I think something that is extremely important but is not uh, talked uh, about too much is making sure that your data strategy team works closely with your planning and buying teams, your performance teams, and that all those teams are unified in the activation process. I think it's the the most important factor in determining the success of of uh, of activation that is often overlooked. Where we have those teams working in parallel uh, rather than working uh, working together. So, if I if I may use a triathlon analogy, it's a bit it's a bit like you know you have an exceptional swim, a really strong bike, and a super fast run. But then you mess up your nutrition on the race day and your whole race absolutely, you know, is affected and goes to shit. I have to tell myself every day with my diet versus my gym plan. So thank <laughs> yeah. you. That's just another reminder today. Um, I love that. I, I, I agree again, agree with everything you've just said, because historically, uh, he's going back to my initial days at Inversum, was there were many brands who just came on for activation. But you touched on so many important topics, which was, you know, and that's just the one off data file that goes in, people use it and off you go. But to your point, there is a lot that has to go behind the scenes of can we use the same file again? And to your point, some users may drop off, some users may not give consent remarketing them in the foreseeable future. Some users may just fall off because they become lapsed. It's maintenance of that database. It's an ongoing journey, right? And hygiene, the cleaning of that data, this profiling, the segmentation, it's an it's a day to day role. Um, and this is why amazing humans like you exist, because you're helping your brands do this. And that kind of goes on to, you know, you, I mean, you've touched on this in the previous response, but beyond just activation, we're we're seeing a lot more of this, Anita, which is insights and planning becoming ever so important. As an agency, as I have asked, you're seeing briefs on a regular basis, and I'm sure you're seeing more and more data driven strategies on there. But how do you see first party data influencing those campaigns, those briefs that you see? I I love that question, and I think it's a, a, a really really good question. So, as you mentioned, we 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 tend to focus a lot on activation side of marketing and advertising uh, when it comes to first party data, but it is actually becoming critical in you know in, in campaign planning, and I th I think soon it will become a key element in in that process, especially with you know technology solutions like yep. like Infosum um, and and data clean rooms that that allow you to work directly with you know data aggregators or, or data providers to first 
gain deeper insights uh, on your audiences by enriching your first party data with their first party data and tapping into data attributes that you wouldn't normally collect or have access to directly from your consumers. So I think an extremely powerful solution for that campaign planning, you know, enriching, refining your audience segments with someone else's first party data. Yep. And then secondly, matching those refined segments directly with media partners to understand the opportunity, um, you know, whether your customers are actually a, a, engaging with, with this specific publisher before you actually create that optimum plan and decide to put your budget uh, behind it. So it's great to be able to, you know, understand those match rates between your first party data and publishers first party data within seconds and use it, you know, later on as a basis for for uh, lookalike creation and, and reaching your uh, reaching new users so you're really using that d data that your customers have shared with you data that is unique to your business as i sort of um explained um, early on to help you plan your best next move and that's the exciting bit because we're gaining intelligence on on these consumers that we historically wouldn't have been able to for many reasons technologies resources legalities etc um but it's also helping us then profile more efficiently, target more efficiently. And isn't that the end goal for every advertiser globally anyway, which is driving efficiency. If we can make our, our budgets work seemingly, you know, more efficiently, simplifying the whole process, um, we then know how we can reinvest more, et cetera, across the wider channels. Um, and are you going to see, do you think we're going to see more and more of this? So, you know, collaboration tools data in general being utilized for campaign planning or just brands using it to just continue gaining intelligence on their on their consumers absolutely i think you know uh the 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 further unification of data, building up on what we're seeing happening in the industry right now, you know, more robust data, quality data will be absolutely the basis for, for more accurate uh, campaign planning. And what I think is, uh, you know, extremely exciting, uh, you know, some of those new technologies that are emerging in, in this in this space. Um, and I, I, here I need to, you know, mention the non-moving of, of, of data. So, you know, the technology that is sort of um, uh, underpinned, uh, so it, that underpins everything that, that Infosum does, you know, any technology that puts data first and allow brands to collaborate without having to share your customer's data, uh, you know, which, which helps sa safeguard that, uh, you know, cons uh, customer privacy. It's it's something that you know we'll, we'll see more of, and we'll be tapping more, um, more, more into um, in the future, both for planning and um, and uh, activation. So, uh, I think you know we need to invest more in in this kind of collaboration and, and provide provide that secure way of working with with data to to further instill that. Uh, trust uh, with consumers, but also within uh, within our industry. You know, um, at the end of the day, your customers trust you with their data and they expect you to control it and handle it in a, in a way that doesn't put the privacy at risk. So, um, you know, I, I think every brand is trying to, to figure out how to unlock the full potential of their data, either for that planning part of, of you know, of, yep. of the yep. campaign or, or activation. Um, so, you know, it's great to see that Thanks to technologies such as you know non movement of data within platforms like Infosum, um, you, you know it, it would it allows you to do exact to do exactly that you know collaborate with that privacy first approach, um, but, but I, I think it, it would be great actually to to you know for more industry giants to to adopt this type of technology when it comes to collaboration, you know we've had some moves from from Google for example who've um, quite recently introduced that you know the pair technology in their DV360 platform. I think I, I think they actually rely on on some of your technology to, to power that solution, um, but it would be great to see this being adopted uh, across you know variety of products and other industry household names, so consumers can really be sure that there is 
you know, no risk to 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 their privacy through data leakage or, or misuse of data, um, etc. Et I mean, thank you. Um, and moving on from just technology itself and and first party data, because all of these solutions in some shape or form allow insights planning, which we've just covered, activation as well. Um, but it also, you know, another topic that we're constantly engaged with is measurement. And now that we're seeing the end of the cookie life, how do you think, um, you know, what's the role with first party data and measurement? How do you see that evolving? Yeah, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, that demise of third party cookies is just one of the elements of the wider degradation of those individual level identifiers and we can we can definitely expect those individual level um, identifiers and observable data to, to continue to decrease so I, I sort of you know refer to that earlier in our conversation we really need to embrace measurement at an aggregated level and modeling to maintain you know that consistency and accuracy or and you know in turn uh continue to 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 drive um drive performance so obviously you know uh quality of data is critical for, for, for reliable modeling and the most reliable data that brands have access to is the first party data. So again, it should be priority when thinking about, you know, post cookie measurement. Um, but uh, we've also seen sort of industry giants, you know, such as Google already have heavily investing in, you know, in, in first party data solutions, I mentioned pair, etc. But also the aggregated level um, and model data. We've seen um, quite recently the launch of the new analytics solutions, Google Analytics 4, and a sunsetting, sunsetting of the, the, the previous version. We also have, you know, the privacy sandbox technology for um, privacy pre preserving signals on uh, campaign uh, performance and something that it's it's extremely you know exciting is that while historically modeling might have been you know reserved for big brands with big budgets it's actually becoming much more accessible so you know that allows all advertisers to enable that uh, accurate measurement on aggregated and anonymized data um, you know, allowing them to, to stay privacy uh, privacy centric and making sure that performance of their campaigns doesn't deteriorate because of lack of that uh, data. And you can you can keep making uh, informed decisions and and drive uh, business outcomes. So, um, yeah, now is definitely the time to further invest in in, in your first party data collection, using it for measurement, uh, using it for modeling, and filling in the gaps that um, you know are created because of some of those changes in our industry. Amazing, um, and and and. That all evolves around um, trust because you can have all this data and you've touched on this numerous times today already, which is having trust with your consumers. And it's not just that consumer level, but um, it's a part of our everyday business. It's a part of our working relationship, the way we provide guidance and, and support to partners. Um, but, to your, you know, there's never a right or wrong answer. There's always change. Um, and we, we're at, a, I think we're at a very healthy place now, but there's still probably room for improvement. And where do you think those changes are? Um, and it's just a two-part question, which is, you know, where are we with the changes today? And more importantly, as an industry, how do we come together to redefine it? Yeah, I, I've actually mentioned how I we actually already seen, uh, you know, seen those those changes with how we work with with our clients, where we really hold each other uh, accountable for, you know, complying to privacy regulations, uh, how we handle our data, and you know, establishing that corporate responsibility, um, um, or, or you know establishing those efforts together um, when we really, you know, consider the impact of our decision on, you know, on all stakeholders, including uh, consumers. So, 
it, it's really good to see that, that the industry started to 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 come uh, to come together to 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 build that trust with with each other. Uh, and I think that a, a key element of of further building that trust is uh, you know transparency. Um, but I think from a wider perspective, it's, it's really refreshing to see so many organizations, you know, within our industry, really putting emphasis on those ethical practices and, you know, some ethical advertising yeah. standards. You know, um, I, I think every business needs um, an ethic, uh, ethical vision. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not uh, I'm not suddenly suggesting that everyone should open an application for a B Corp, uh, although it would be great to see more businesses yeah. committing to some of yeah. those, you know, B, B Corp uh, legal requirements. But holding up a mirror and making some small changes within your own, um, within your own organization can really lead to, to more meaningful business relations um within within the industry and it goes back to that saying doesn't it it's as a human um who wears multiple hats as an employee as a family member as a friend etc um but also as a consumer it's almost like how would you want to be treated right and if you put yourself in that mindset you can help your businesses and the industry move forward because you're almost just making it all relatable um, and to wrap it up, we've learned a lot about you and, you know, the amazing work you're doing at Havas and how you're seeing brands, media owners, data partners, technology changing, evolving. Um, but data collaboration itself is in the mix of all of this journey. It's going to continue evolving years to come with alongside privacy because privacy regulations only get um stringent as we move on i mean what's your prediction for the future like we're seeing you know we're, we're in the day-to-day of collaboration and privacy and and, and how consumer trust etc um what's next do you know what i think we'll continue on this you know trajectory where we see further unification of data building up on what we currently seeing happening in the industry right now so you know more robust data uh quality of data um as i mentioned before you know for as a basis for more accurate models uh that fur- that further you know drive uh a few of the optimization um you know I-, I think brands are still only utilizing a, a fraction of their first party data or it's happening across a really small number of, of their, you know, activity or, or campaigns. But this is going to change completely. I think that, you know, by centralizing their data in, you know, a, for example, CDPs, as I mentioned, and building that 360 degree view of their uh, customers, brands will be able to become truly customer centric and drive meaningful engagement with with consumers so as i mentioned we we're already heading in that direction but i think we'll fully embrace it in 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 the next couple of years you know moving away from data silos and sort of fragmented insights and i think that's that's super exciting it's, if only we could have that magic crystal ball, right, and just see where we actually will land up. But it's going back to your point, the excitement of not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring to us, um, whether it's the technology, whether it's the regulations. There's so much ahead of us. And I, it's just great that we're a part of it on a day-to-day basis. So looking forward to this, Anita. Um, we are going to slowly wrap up, but we've got two more any i mean the first question is is um we've spoken at length about the industry the data journeys etc um what the future holds for us anything you'd want to add that you know that would be useful or valuable to the wider audience listening in today i think we've touched on so many so many different but so many important elements uh i I think i just you know to, to wrap it up i just want to you know reiterate that we are all a part of it and you know um, respecting consumers privacy and, and and how we handle data in our everyday jobs um you know it, it's a a collaborative effort and together we can really steer the industry in 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 the right way but i mean i think we we all we covered 
all of that in in our conversation so it's just as a a few final words from me i guess thank you anita it's been an absolute pleasure having you on today thank you for your time um thank you so always. much for having me it's it's yeah. been it's been real pleasure uh chatting to you um in in slightly different uh environment that that we would normally chat exactly exactly so like i always say it's like two friends having a coffee and just catching up on the state of our industry right anita absolute pleasure having you on today it's been it's been brilliant thank you so much Thanks again to Anita for joining us on Identity Architects. Anita had such incredible insight and fantastic advice for organizations at various stages of their data strategy. So thank you so much for that. All that leaves for me to do is to remind you to hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode of Identity Architects lands. But until then, thanks for listening.